Well, good morning, and grace and peace be to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is a message that has been prepared for Sunday morning, uh, July 5th. Hard to believe it's July already. But uh, as we uh, continue to look into this prophet Jeremiah and his sermons that uh, God gave him to deliver to the people. We're going to be looking at Jeremiah chapter 4 through Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse, verse 30 this morning. Uh, again, you'll be able to find this a little bit later on Right Now Media. Under Jeremiah Sermon 10, is this is the 10th sermon in our, in our series on, on Jeremiah. Uh, the, me- the title uh, of the message, again, is this morning is, is Rejected, Rejected Silver. Now, uh, we are in the middle, really, of Jeremiah's first sermon, a message that he was given to proclaim uh, to the people of Judah. It began in chapter 2, and it will continue on through chapter 6 and verse 30 that we'll look at today. You might say that's a really, really long sermon. Uh, yes, it, it is a really, really wrong sermon. You might also say it is kind of repetitive. I mean, he keeps repeating himself the same judgments, the same calls for repentance, the same calls to return to me over and over and over again. Uh, yeah, he does. Why? Why do you think he does that over and over again? The same plea, the same calls, the same pointing out the same sins and the same judgments, sometimes using different perspectives, a few different words, different symbols and illustrations and metaphors. Could it be that sinful, rebellious men are hard of hearing, blind and really can't see? obstinate and refuse to listen, let alone to do what God tells them to do. But God, in His love, in His compassion, His mercy, doesn't give up. He keeps telling them over and over and over again because they didn't get it the first time. But He also didn't give up on them. That's the long-suffering, the mercy and compassion of God. Like a father to his children, telling them over and over and over again. Like I said, How many times do I have to tell you, you know, come straight home from school? And they don't, and they get in trouble. And he's got to tell them again, how many times do I? And and so that's why we see all this repetitive. It is so like us. And he is so much wants to be our father. If we'll only listen and obey and learn from uh, from what he's trying, trying to tell us. Do you have the patience that God has for sinful rebels? I don't think any of us have that kind of patience. God sure is patient with his children. I don't know that that we're that patient with our own children. I mean, we read these stories in the Old Testament. We think, wonder why lightning bolts didn't come out of the sky and just turn them all into grease spots on the road. But God loved them, even in their sinfulness. That's the beauty of this sermons of this weeping prophet and why there's so much repetitives. So I'm going to uh, uh, go on and, and look at a few passages. Now I'm not going to preach every verse because there is repetitiveness and we would be going over the same thing over and over again. But I won't leave that's your responsibility. You need to read Jeremiah's sermons. And yes, they're long sermons. And yes, he's going to go over the same points over and over and over and over again. Uh, but God wrote it that way and gave it to Jeremiah to preach to us and to preach to Judah and to Israel as well. And so uh, you need to go back and go through. But for the sake of time and taping these messages and the little limited time that we have on a Sunday morning together, uh, I'm going to let you take uh, most of those verses that aren't repetitive. I'm going to go through and glean some high spots uh, as we finish up this uh, first sermon of Jeremiah. First, again, he begins in verses 1 through 3, again with the same plea over and over. The, The plea... Return to me of a husband for a bride that's went astray. If you will return to me, O Israel, return to me, declares the Lord. If you put your idols out of my sight and no longer go astray, and if in a truthful, just, and righteous way you swear, as surely as the Lord lives, then the nations will be blessed by him, and in him they will glory. This is what the Lord says to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem. Break up your unplowed ground and do not sow 
among the thorns. You know, this portion of God's message to Israel through Jeremiah begins with this loving plea again that we see over and over. Oh, Israel, return to me with all that she had done, with all of her adulteries and and prostitution, God calls it, and breaking the yoke and running off on him and no longer submitting to him. He'd still take her back if she just acknowledged her sin and return to him. Now, touching verse 3 here where it says, break up your your uh, unplowed ground and do not sow among the thorns. You see, the word of God isn't going to do anything for them if, because they're hardened hearts, uh, the ground has not been plowed. In other words, you've got to open your heart to God or that seed is just going to bounce off of that unplowed ground. We saw Jesus saw the same thing. In the, the parable of the sower, remember he came forth and he sowing the seed everywhere, the broadcast and the good news. But, but that that fell on unplowed ground, the hard ground, didn't avail anything. So he's saying, first you folks need to clean out your ears. You need to open your heart to Jeremiah's preaching. Or it's not going to do any good. You've got to repent with a broken heart over your sinfulness. Then it might be possible for you to receive some of this seed. He goes on to talk about this heart problem that they have secondly in verses 4 and verse 14. Skipping around. Again, in verse 4 he says about this heart problem, circumcise yourselves to the Lord. That's cut off the fleshy part okay, of, of, of your heart. Circumcise your hearts. The Bible speaks of two circumcisions. It's cutting off of the flesh, cutting off of the world, no longer living for the carnal man or the natural man, but rather living for God in covenant, which is what a picture of circumcision was. But it's, the Bible, again, speaks of two circumcisions. There's the real circumcisions, which is the circumcision of your heart. Give your heart to God. Choose God rather than going the way of the world, the way of the flesh. Circumcise yourself to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts, you men of Judah and people of Jerusalem, or my wrath will break out and burn like a fire because of the evil you have done. Burn with no one to quench it. See, that part is their responsibilities. You're the ones who hardened your heart to me and quit following me. You need to break up that unplowed ground. You need to open your heart up through repentance. A broken heart over your sinfulness. Let my words in and I'll take you back. And then you can return to me. But you're going to have to circumcise yourselves. You got yourself into this hardened mess. Only you can choose to get yourself out. Oh, Jerusalem. He says in verse 14, Wash the evil from your heart and be saved. How long will you harbor wicked thoughts? See, you're still harboring wickedness in your heart. Again, Josiah is attempting an outward reformation, but God wants a reformation to begin in their hearts. But that ground's going to have to be plowed open. That heart's going to be having to open up broken uh, before God, or you're going to taste my wrath. And again, Jeremiah's preaching to people with hard hearts. That seed's just bouncing off. But this is what they need to do. They have a heart problem if they're going to return to God. Might put it this way. If there was a motto here for Jeremiah, he might be passing out brochures that says, Only you can prevent heart disease. Well, that's true of us, too, watching what we eat, getting some exercise, doing a little cardio, cardio you know, doing those kind of things. But, but, but to sit around, to give in to the flesh, all that fat and cholesterol and all that other stuff, right? Going to have a heart problem. They had a heart problem. It was bad. But it was a heart problem that they needed to correct. And then they could return, return to God. You're going to have to deal with a heart problem. All Josiah and Jeremiah could do is deal with the externals. But only they could receive the word of God into their hearts and be transformed from the inside out. Again, verses 18 through 19, jumping ahead. Your own conduct. Your own conduct, verse 18, and actions have brought this, uh, have brought this upon you. In other words, the reason you're suffering all of these, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, drought we'll talk about later and the sword and the plagues that are going to come, uh, and the destruction ultimately by Babylon. You're going to, somebody, many of you are going to be killed. Some are going to be taken to captivity. And there's already going to be several captivities. But he says, this is your punishment. How bitter it is. How it pierces to the heart. 
Oh, my anguish, my anguish. I writhe in pain. Oh, the agony of my heart. My heart pounds within me. I cannot keep silent, for I have heard the sound of the trumpet. That's Babylon coming. And I have heard the battle cry. Yes. God sent Jeremiah to preach that judgment upon you. But you're blaming God for the judgment. You brought this on yourself, your own conduct, verse 18, and your actions have brought the God didn't do this to you. You did it to yourself. I always use this illustration with folks that come sometimes in counseling, depending on the situation. But in many cases, I, I use the illustration. You took a stick and you sharpened the end of that stick. And then you stick it in your ear and you go, ow, 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 it hurts. Oh, the agony, oh, the pain. Guess what? Don't stick a stick in your ear and it won't hurt. That's what God is saying. Obey me. Follow my commands. Serve me from your heart. Turn your heart back to me. But you're crying out, oh, the anguish, the anguish. But you're the ones who stuck that stick in your ear. And you blame God for what you're suffering? The solution is repent. Open your heart to God. Take his yoke upon you. It's easy. Follow him. Come back to the word of God. Don't blame God for what is coming and the judgment that's in the world and his chastisement and punishment that's come upon your nation. Blame yourself. Quit sticking that stick in your ear. Stop it. It's that simple. Fourthly, uh, in chapter 4, verse 22, uh, we're going to talk about sottish children. That's right. S-O-T-T-I-S-H. Uh, that's an old English word found in the King James, which is trying to be polite. Uh, it describes uh, God's children. God's children are sottish children. Now, in the New American Standard Bible, they don't, they don't spare any words, and, and, and they just get right to the heart of the matter. And they interpret that word sottish a little bit different. Uh, again, the King James says, For my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children. They have no understanding. They are wise to do evil. But to do good, they have no knowledge. The New American Standard puts it this way. For my people are foolish. They know not me. They are stupid children. Ah, that's what sodish means. And sodish is the nice way of saying it. My kids, God says, are stupid kids. And you know how I know that's true? Because I'm one of them. I'm one of them sodish, stupid kids. And I know that's a fact. Um, you know... And I can, I can attest to that. We're foolish children, God says. But again, I want you to see the patience of God our Father to put up with stupid kids. Now, now, many of you have been parents, those that you haven't. Don't tell me you haven't thought that or maybe even said that sometimes. How can you be so stupid? Have you lost your senses? And, and then you tell them over and over and over again. And, and, and yeah, because we're all a bunch of stupid kids. God's got a bunch of stupid kids. And by the way, you can have the best father in the world. Okay, he brought them out of bondage, gave them a land of milk and honey, cared for them, protected them from the sword and from the famine. And yet they turned to be out a bunch of stupid, rebellious kids. Is God a bad father? He provided a perfect environment for Adam and Eve in the garden. Only one rule. And which way did his stupid children go? And what did they choose to do? We're all stupid kids. And like I said, my dad, when I was uh, uh, younger, he'd been in the military, but he worked for a parachute shop for a while back in the Korean War days. And he would bring home stuff from the parachute shop. They would repair parachutes and and he got to learn how to use one of those commercial sewing machines and, and fixing parachutes and packing parachutes. But there's a drag chute that uh, goes inside the big chute. It's a pilot chute, it's called. And the pilot chute comes out first out of the back of an airplane on a drag chute, like a B-52. And it's about the size of a cast net, six foot uh, around, a, a nice size little little parachute for a kid. And then it pulls out the big drag chute for the, help the airplane to slow down on the runway. Well, they, are only, uh, they have a shelf life, and they're only allowed to do so many landings, and they have to be replaced. So he brought me home one that he had repaired up, one of these uh, pilot chutes about six foot around. And uh, I remember putting my red flyer wagon on the roof of the house. And you could, you could put the two back wheels over the pitch, pitch on the roof and it would hold it. And then tied that drag chute behind my red flyer wagon and, and thinking I could, I could come off of that roof and that drag chute uh, about six foot around would uh, 
lead me nice and softly to the ground. Well, there's a lot of problems with that engineering thing. I wasn't strapped into that wagon. And once you separate from the wagon, you ain't got anything. But anyway, we learn that way. We're all a bunch of stupid children. We, we try stupid stuff. I know that. At least I do. Maybe you don't. I do. Uh, I'm lucky to have survived, I think, many times in my childhood because I was a sottish child. Well, again, God loves these folks, but they're stupid kids. It seems like the only thing that, that, that they're smart at is, is doing bad stuff, evil. They could figure out how to do evil. But, but to figure out how to do good, he says, they have no knowledge. Can you relate to any of that? I can. And I think I can relate to the love of God and how uh, it must be. And in our own kids and raising them, trying to have the patience, the patience of God. Um, what God is looking for, then in chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, as we, again, we kind of skip around and glean ahead. What is God looking for in people? Well, here it is. Go up and down the streets of Jerusalem. Look around and consider, search through her squares. If you can find but one person who deals honestly, their life matches, that is, their mouth. That is a genuine person, not a hypocrite. Find one person who seeks the truth, and I'll forgive this city. Jeremiah, go throughout the city and find me one honest man or one honest woman. Who what they say they believe in their mouth is what's true in their life. Their mouth matches their life. Although they say, as surely as the Lord lives, still, still they are swearing falsely. They refuse correction. They made their faces harder than stone. They refused to repent. With one accord, they too had broken off the yoke and torn off the bonds. Oh, they call him our father, but they live in life their way, not following his reigning, not serving him and following uh, him as he reigns him to the right or reigns him to the left. Why should I forgive you? You children have forsaken me. You have sworn by other gods that are not gods. I supplied all your needs or all their needs, yet they committed adultery and throng to the houses of prostitution. I gave you everything, and you still ran off from me, and you refused to serve me and bear my yoke. Jeremiah, go try and find me somebody who's an honest person, whose life matches the profession of their mouth. I believe God is still looking today for one honest man, one honest woman, going throughout the land, if you can find one, I'll spare the city. That's what God is saying. God needs honest people today who not only talk about their Christianity, but who live it. Who not only have an outward form of, of Christianity, but a circumcised heart. A heart that's open and in tune with God and that loves Him with their whole heart. That's what God wants. And then in verses 16 through 20, again, uh, skipping ahead, talks about the old ways. And this is important, I think, too, for our nation today and where we are. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths. I believe our nation is at a, at a crossroads. I believe there's many churches in America today that are at a crossroads. Do we just continue to do the old status quo? Or do we need to do some genuine change beginning with our hearts? Do we need to turn back to the Word of God and loving Him? This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Now, what are the ancient paths? The old ways. You know, when I go to the church, and, and it's empty a lot uh, these days of, of pandemic, and I walk around the, the, the uh, uh, sanctuary and look around getting stuff ready for Sunday or just sometimes going in there to pray or to think, and, uh, and uh, there's a song that keeps going through my head every time I walk through that sanctuary. You know what it is? Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. That's the old ways, the ancient paths. We need to get back to the Bible. We need to get back to where God is, is, is the sum total of everything in our lives. And that's what God is saying. This is what the Lord says. Stand in the crossroads. When you're at a crossroads in your life, when you're at a crossroads in your nation's history, as a nation. And look, ask for the old ways. What was wrong with the old paths? Why, why did you change it? You thought you had a better way? Well, how's that working out for you? Like that stick you sharpened and stuck in your ear and then you complain about it? Ask where the good way is. Walk in it and you will find rest 
for your souls. You, you want to find rest for your souls? You want a song in your heart? Give me that old time religion. But instead of doing that, you said we will not walk in it. No, we don't want to walk in those old ways. I appointed watchmen over you and said, listen to the sound of the trumpet. That's a guard that like guarded the city. Ezekiel, Isaiah, we're all watchmen. Jeremiah is a watchman. They were, their job was, was, nobody was going to hear them, but your job was to stay in the tower. When you see judgment or the enemy coming, blow the trumpet and warn the people. He told Ezekiel, if you warn the people, their blood isn't on your hands. Doesn't matter whether they respond or not. That's, that's up to them. Our job is just to blow the trumpet and warn them. Blow the trumpet. But you said we will not listen. Therefore, here, oh, see, we don't want nothing new. We don't want to change our lives. We, want to, we don't want to get back to the Bible. Therefore, here, nations, observe, O oh, witnesses, what will happen to them. Here, O oh, earth, I am bringing disaster on this people. The fruit of their schemes. In other words, you're only going to reap what you sowed. All that evil that you sowed and all that stuff that you pursue after instead of loving me, you're going to get it all. You're going to reap the fruit of your own schemes because they have not listened to my words and have rejected my law. You need to get back to the Bible. You need to get back to the ancient past, to the old ways. But nope, you said we ain't going to hear that. That's not what we want. We're, we're modern, contemporary people. We're moving on. We're moving on up. No, you're not. Judgment is lurking, lurking at the door because you have rejected the ancient paths of your forefathers, faith of our fathers, and uh, you're going to inherit the fruit of your own schemes. God is looking for one honest man, one honest woman. Verse 20 says, What do I care about incense from Sheba, faraway lands, exotic incense, or sweet calmus from the distant land? What, what do I care about all these expensive stuff that you use in worship? You know, uh, all these tools you have now, all these musical instruments and fancy incense and all your fancy worship, your burnt offerings are not acceptable. Your sacrifices do not please me. What pleases God? The old ways, the old paths that you long departed for, thinking all this fancy foo for -ra somehow excites me. It doesn't. What I'm looking for is one honest man, one honest woman whose profession matches the inner life that they have. Eighthly and finally, verses 27 through 30, refuse silver. I have made you a tester of metals, speaking to Jeremiah, uh, uh, to test metals. Now think of a pawn shop. You know, you go in there and maybe you got some gold or some silver and how they test it and they weigh it, see how pure it is and how much it's going to be worth on the scales. Well, that's what I've made you, Jeremiah. I made you a tester of metals to, to check these metals out and see what they're worth. And my people, the ore, that, that you may observe and test their ways. Okay? They are all hardened rebels going about to slander. And again, so much of that meanness in the world today. They are bronze and iron. They are all act corruptly. The, the bellows blow uh, fiercely to burn away the lead with the fire. In other words, I'm got, I need you to refine them. And it's going to be fire that's going to refine them. But, he says, the refining goes on in vain. So, Jeremiah, you're, you're trying to refine them by preaching these sermons. Uh, you're trying to separate, out, separate the lead uh, from the gold, he says. And they're refining, but it goes on in vain because you can't separate it. The wicked are not purged out. You can't, you can't get the lead. The, the city, the nation has become so sinful, it has become impossible to separate the gold from the lead, the good metal from the bad metal. They're so fused together. And so, he says, they are called rejected silver because the Lord has rejected them. Rejected silver is what he's called this nation, the nation of Israel, or Judah rather, and formerly the nation of Israel because sin had gotten so entrenched there's no turning back now. You can't find me one honest man out there that's 100% pure silver or one honest woman. They've been so mixed in and enculturated the nation that you can't separate the two out. That's why I'm coming to destroy them. Calico Ghost Town, out Mojave Desert, near San Bernardino. I used to love to visit there when I was a kid. I grew up in California. Dad was stationed out there in, in the service. But if you go, ever get to go to Calico Ghost Town, it was an old silver mine, uh, a boom town. 
Uh, it's now a ghost town, but it was a boom town in those days. And you will see they used the old-fashioned stamping mills where, where, where weight would be lifted up uh, by mules or, or by draft horses and then drop down and smash uh, the, the, the ore and the silver would be separated uh, from the rest of the ore. But it wasn't a 100% good process. Some of the silver would still be mixed in with some of the ore, but uh, you couldn't separate it. It was so small a little amount of silver uh, in the ore, it was just piled up in piles, and then they would move that stamper over. Well, there's mountains and mountains of, of this silver ore that had been stamped, you know, into little, little teeny rocks uh, stacked up there. This slap full of silver, but you can't separate it out. Refuse silver. They, it would cost more to separate what little silver there is out from that ore than what the silver would be worth, which the process of refining costs more than the silver's worth. Refuse silver. Well, well that's, that's what, what God is, is saying here. The nation had become refuse silver. It's going to cost more to separate out what little value there is in you. So I'm going to destroy the whole nation. Refuse refuse cereal. Actually, the state of California had put out a grant uh, many years ago that anybody who could figure out a way to separate all that silver, and I mean, there's mountains of it, if anybody could figure out a cost-effective way to separate out that silver from that ore from the most stamping mills, they could have it. Wow. But again, nobody's come up with a process. But that's what God is saying about this nation. And that's what happens when sin starts to get entrenched in a church, in a town, in a city in a state, in a country, they become like refuse silver. There's no refining and no amount of refining that's going to be able to separate it out. So God destroys it all and starts all over again. Remember, he began this letter telling Jeremiah he's going to go forth. He has to demolish the old before you can build the new. You got to plow out, plow down the old before you can put in a new crop. You got to pluck out or destroy. In conclusion, uh, in spite of being having a bunch of sottish children, adulterous, immoral, stupid kids, the God of love says in chapter 4 and verse 1, Oh, just return to me. Return to me. Just repent and believe. Just agree with me that you're sinners. Stupid sinners who have to be told over and over and over and over and over again. Just agree and repent. Rend your heart. So I could plant some good seed in there. And believe. Believe that I did for you what I said I did for you. Believe that I love you even in spite of your sinfulness and accept my free gift of salvation. Repent. Acknowledge your sin and be saved, he said. Finally, the, 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 the final thing would be to confess him as Lord. Let him be the boss of your life. Wear his yoke. Let him lead and guide you and also feed and protect and care for you. Instead of going your own way, that every man has gone his own way. You know, Jeremiah 4.14 says, Wash the evil from your heart and be saved. Let God purge that evil out. Give him your heart, all of it. He'll purge it out. Submit to him. Acknowledge those sins. Confess those sins. And be saved. You know, there's a hymn we sing as we go to communion this morning. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's God's call. Come to me. Wash the evil from your heart, the blood of Jesus Christ, and be saved. God bless you.